Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. And joining me in the podcast studios this week is Dr. Jason Hocker. Uh, Dr. Jason is a partner and veterinarian with AMVC based out of Iowa. Jason, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. I uh, look forward to chatting with you today. Um, why don't you start with a little bit of uh, introduction? Tell folks a little bit about what you do there at AMVC and how you got in the pig industry in the first place. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Clayton. Um, yeah, I've been at AMVC for 17 years now. I uh, graduated from Iowa State 2006 with my veterinary degree and a master's. And uh, at AMVC, I'm a, a partner in veterinarian here and kind of work in all facets of our business, but uh, do a lot with our managed swine production on both sow and finishing side. And uh, farm boy grew up in eastern Iowa on a swine and row crop farm, and that's how I got into the agriculture field. Yeah, um, glutton for punishment, right? Right. So, Jason, you've been a veterinarian for 17 years, uh, you know, around the industry your whole life, it sounds like. Um, we're recording this here in August, and August is a great time to be a pig veterinarian right? Like we're going to worry about electricity and water at the farms, but disease is pretty slow. We're going to talk about PERS today. So I assume you're going to tell me PERS is good. You know, it's the summer. We don't really have to worry about it. We got things totally under control. Is that correct? Well, you know, that used to be the case. Um, you used to get kind of the three month window here to, to sit back and regroup and get ready for the onslaught. But it's, uh, whatever's changed, it, it seems like, uh, you know, there's never a time to relax anymore. Yeah. PERS brings a lot of change to us. Talk to me about your experiences, Jason. I mean, how have the management strategies you've employed with PERS changed through the years? And then how have the outcomes changed, good, bad, or indifferent? Yeah, great question. You know, the, we had a, a, a good run with the load, close, homogenized type programs. You know, load your farm up with gilts, maintain breed target as best you can, get to the end. And Pharaoh your last guilt and, and you're back on track and, and rolling. You know, today, unfortunately, PERS isn't doing that anymore. And our the closures fail and they fail towards the end. And sometimes they fail multiple times. So my head today is in a space where I, I think, um, you know, in my mind, there's a persistently infected state in animals. That's the only way I can explain these failures and, you know, our with our the, the diagnostics we have today and the ability to monitor and, and get to the end and then inexplicably have positive results from animals that ought to have solid immunity, you know, something's going on there. So I've been looking at it as more of a holistic approach to sow comfort. How do we keep that sow comfortable? And I like to use the analogy of, a, you know, the old seventh grade science test of take a penny and you, you have a dropper of water and it's a surface tension thing, right? How many, how many drips of water can you put on top of that penny before it overflows and and i look at the sow's immune system the same way and that um you know the more stressors you put on her and depending upon the magnitude maybe that flares up that pers virus again that's hanging out in the lymphoid tissue you know whether it's the spleen or the, the lymph node or tonsil or wherever but you, you know when i think about things walking through farms like the louver that's busted on the fan you know and, and it's allowing cold air to draft the sow or hot air for that matter you know it doesn't matter the time of year or the, the water line that's been dripping on the sow's back, or, you know, just the little things that happen within a sow farm that, that make her uncomfortable. You know, she missed a feeding because her feed tube's plugged, or the feed ran out before it got to the end of the line. Just all those little tiny things that every day add up and get to the point of pushing that sow into a stress state such that she starts to shed again. And, and so from that perspective, with that mindset, it kind of shifted the viewpoint of, you know, we, we don't want to shed virus. I don't know that we can get rid of it. We just don't want to be shedding it. Mm -hmm. So even looking at our closures today, um, we're shifting more to a quality of breed versus quantity of breed. You know, I think we're our own worst enemies in some sense in that we, we have a breed target that's just, you know, artificially set. We want this many animals bred. Uh, I think we got to look at the quality of breeds. And we've had some experiences to where in doing this, we get nearly the same production with quality breeds as we do when we have an arbitrary breed target and we keep animals around that shouldn't probably be there. Can you get good quality breeds done on a farm that's actively, a sow farm, that's actively infected with one of these really, really nasty viruses? I mean, is that a realistic opportunity no matter how many animals that you can hit the breed target with? 
Yeah, and I, w- I would say, you know, on these nasty ones, I think you, you need to look at the depopulation, repopulation option again. And I think, uh, unfortunately, for and there'll be people that have gone through it would probably agree in hindsight they should have done that because, in essence, that's what happened. You know, they, it's been so devastating that when you go 20 weeks without a, a, a quality weaned pig and, and the subsequent rebreeds are that bad, you'd have been better off just to, to start over. Um, and then even just from a holistic perspective of the industry, if you even are able to put a wean pig out there, you're just putting more viral RNA out there to do other bad stuff. So, you know, and that's that's more of a, a big picture view. And it's hard when you're looking at the economics of your own pocketbook and a depop repop. But at the end of the day, I think healthy pounds, healthy sows are going to produce more pounds more efficiently. And in that math, is more attractive today than it's ever been. Yeah. Jason, you know, sometimes the pocketbook doesn't allow for an expense like a deep op repop, but let's assume for a second that the producer is is not in a situation where they're heavily leveraged and there's just no room whatsoever to, you know, borrow or, or facilitate that purchase of new gilts. Um, what are some of the economic drivers that you help a producer think through? If they said, I got this bad, bad PERS virus, I want to get negative as fast as possible, and I'm open to the depop repop thing, what are kind of some of the, the the marginal economic values, the costs, the revenues, things like that that you'll throw on the table to say, well, producer, you know, I don't know your numbers for these, but these are kind of the categories of costs and future revenues we need to compare in either outcome, or either scenario. Yeah. And I, so, you know, just kind of the back of the napkin thing, I think um, the, the genetic improvement is real. And when you get your parity structure out of whack and you've gone through closures, what we've seen is it's at least a two pig difference at weaning, you know, for a significant period of time, probably the next two to three years, as you get your parity structure, right. Especially in that scenario where you don't have a lot of capital available for large guilt purchases or, or that sort of thing. So, over the next three years, you're you're giving that up. And then what is that worth to you? And then on top of that, what is that downstream health worth to you when you're, you know, if you're languishing in that 85% grade one pig going to market, you know, you're there's seven, eight percent you're leaving on the table there. And what's that worth to you? And so those are the the quick numbers that a producer could do to look at, you know, how do I evaluate this this opportunity? Do I live with three years of marginal production or do I take a hit and I get back to to high quality production and hopefully for a long period of time. Jason, if I've got gilts available and I could start breeding them somewhere tomorrow, do you do you consider an off-site breeding project while you farrow out the existing inventory at that PERS positive sow farm? Or is that more hassle than it's worth? And let's just dump the inventory at the sow farm, clean it up, then bring those nice pristine gilts to the sow farm to do the breeding project there and not the finisher somewhere. You know, we've, uh, we're doing it both ways at the moment, actually. And, and it, it, it can work if you've got an offsite location and you can dedicate some staff that's, that's good at heat check and, and pen breeding is not easy, but it's possible. So, um, yeah, I think either one can work. Um, uh, we've run into those hiccups to where, uh, you know, the offsite breed project, and then we were going to bring those animals back thinking we'd be negative and the farm wasn't. And so, We've actually run a farm kind of half and half for quite a period of time until it, it kind of ultimately failed. But, you know, I think just that the little internal biosecurity things um, stack up and, and can get you through that process. So if you're going to do the deep op repop, there's going to have to be at some point some downtime, right? Whether there's an offsite breeding project or you do it on site. What do you recommend, Jason, to producers last pig out to first pig in? What's kind of the timeline you'd say is the minimum we really need to have? I think it's it's whatever you can do to get that farm clean, clean, dried, disinfected, dried again. Um, you know, get your pits empty and clean as, as best you can. Um, I ultimately that that farm that I referenced before that that failure was probably due to a pit backing up and. You know, should PERS virus be living there? No, it probably shouldn't. But what, maybe that was a stressing event that allowed it to reemerge. But um, yeah, it comes down to just what you can manage on farm in, in terms of cleaning, drying, disinfecting. And when I say cleaning, I think um, as cleaning today, and I think cleanliness is another just big, holistic, broad approach. 
I, I speak of cleaning today as in our, our PED cleanup type cleanings, right? Mm -hmm. We When we go through PED, we go through and we're, we're making that farm a hospital type environment. We're, we're getting things extremely clean. We're washing behind every animal movement. And I don't think we can stop doing that. I think that's got to be the new norm going forward because anytime you lax on that, it starts to just kind of spiral and, and it all comes down to labor. We all know that, you know, people get tired of that, but it has to become the new expectation that here's the level of cleanliness we need, not only from PED standpoint, but PERS or rotavirus or strep or whatever we're dealing with in the farm, that all those things are all involved in that. And, and cleanliness is a huge thing. I heard somewhere that cleanliness was next to godliness, if I remember. Yeah, yeah absolutely. L Biotics the pioneer postbiotic for digestive health in pigs. Brought to you by Adair Biome. With over a century of experience in postbiotics for digestive health, L-Biotics contains heat-treated lactobacillus cell bodies and their metabolites. Stable by nature, L-Biotics can be easily stored and incorporated in compound feed. Well, Jason, thank you very much for coming on the show. I know uh, PERS is not a situation where any of us have a silver bullet. And I really appreciate, you know, you thinking outside the box with the depop repops and everything else you're doing to try and chip away at this overwhelming, it feels like a times challenge. Absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity. Yep. Well, thanks to the audience. I appreciate everybody out there listening. Um, if you haven't checked out our uh, website, please go listen or go, please go uh, check it out at swinehealthblackbelt.com. And subscribe to the podcast so that you not only don't miss out on Jason's episode, but every good episode we put out every week. Uh, for Dr. Jason Hocker, I'm Clayton Johnson. Thanks and have a great rest of your day. Hey, everybody. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it, share it with us, please feel free to email the research to hello at wisenetics.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at W-I-S-E-N-E-T-I-X dot com. Um.